right, we're going to go ahead and get started and let people continue to trickle in as we go. Um, but hello, my name is Abby Griffith. I am the owner and founder of Clarity Fitness, and we are Georgia's first body positive fitness center. We are weight inclusive and eating disorder informed and are really big on just providing a safe and positive place for people to move their bodies online and in person in the downtown Decatur Square. And we're really, really excited to have this conversation tonight because we get a lot of people um, that come to Clarity, that come to their health journey in different ways and are looking to make body changes, which we totally understand and don't want to demonize. But we also want to have a conversation around how there's a lot more than just the number on the scale at play, especially when it relates to mental health and seeing your body in a positive light. So we are really, really excited to have that conversation, to learn more, and to get resources to take some of the stress and pressure off of that headspace when it can get kind of all-consuming. So I'm going to pop some special codes in the chat. We have a really big discount on our Clarity Online platform tonight, which has some really cool fitness resources, um, on-demand movement classes and movement sessions that are on our awesome Clarity Online website that we'd love to share with y'all. And um, we are, I'm going to be in the chat throughout the evening. So if anything comes up, definitely let me know. And um, without further ado, I'm really, really excited to uh, pass the mic to Kristen Steinberg. She has been a buddy of mine for a few years now, and she has a practice called Fig Tree Therapy, um, and it's also in the Decatur area, and she is absolutely phenomenal. So we're so excited to have her here tonight, and I'll go ahead and pass the Zoom mic over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Um, yeah, so just to introduce myself a little bit um, and sort of why I'm coming to this space and my background. So I'm a therapist who works a lot with um, individuals either in eating disorder recovery, stepping down from treatment, or just sort of wanting to work on body image in general or have some question marks around like, am I being super healthy or is this crossing into a disordered space? Um, like Abby said, I have my own practice called Fig Tree Therapy Indicator. I've also worked in eating disorder treatment, so with um, some folks who are a bit more acute um, and have seen people recover, and the stuff we'll be talking about tonight is all the stuff that treatment looks like. Um, so if you are struggling with body image stuff or just want to see your body in a different way than you've been taught, um, then we're going to go over some of that stuff tonight. Okay, so I want to just sort of contextualize what this talk is about, why it's important, right? We are in February, so we're right in this sort of sandwich between spot of New Year's resolutions, setting really maybe intense goals, New Year, New Me, wanting to change our bodies, hit the gym, gyms get a lot busier, right? So in treatment, we talk about sort of the cycle of dieting, where we get really, really strict with things, right? really restrictive potentially. And we talk about what we restrict is what we binge, right? So if we're constantly swinging wildly between these pen this pendulum shift, if I tell myself, okay, I'm not going to have starches for the next 30 days, that's a pretty unreasonable goal, right? And our bodies need starches. So I might make it seven days and then I'm going to have no limits. I might eat past fullness, feel really physically uncomfortable, right? And then that might bring me a lot of distress physically, emotionally, mentally. And then I'm going to get right back on that really strict diet train. So diets don't work. We know that, right? If they did work, then we would only have to do it one time and there wouldn't be this huge industry around it. So we want to sort of exit this cycle. And that's sort of what we'll look at tonight as well. So how do we know if we're sort of crossing over a line from just a lifestyle change, a lifestyle shift into disordered or unhealthy sort of arenas? Like Abby said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to feel comfortable in our bodies. We don't want to demonize it. Um, it's a human need to want to feel comfortable and like people want to be around us, right? And our culture has taught us that in order to do that we have to change our appearance, right? Or be smaller or fitter or whatever the current sort of body trend is. 
Um, so again, a very human need to and desire to want to like yourself and accept yourself, but we want to really be aware when it's getting into a place that it's affecting our mental health and ultimately doing more harm than good. So some maybe red flags, orange flags, whatever you want to call them, are obsessive thoughts, right? If we're noticing that in our fitness journey or in eating differently, we're really starting to focus on or obsess over one body part, right? We know that um, getting healthier and sort of moving our bodies more, whatever our motivations are, it's potentially going to change our body in ways that we can't notice externally at all, right? Heart health, um, making our bones stronger, all of those things, regulating some hormones, all of those things are important for us. So if we're starting to focus on changing the shape of our legs only, and that is sort of consuming our desire to move our bodies or work out, then it's something to consider, right? Also obsessive thoughts can look like not deviating from planned food. So like planning meals ahead of time, being really rigid with that, um, only allotting for certain food groups or types of foods. And then if a friend calls you and say, hey, I have an extra ticket to go to this show, there's dinner here, do you wanna go with me? If we're sort of consistently not straying from what we have planned because it makes us uncomfortable, it's something to think about too. Calorie counting. Um, Overall, it's very tempting, right? There's a lot of apps that make it very easy, but they can turn into obsessions, right? Um, it can sort of turn into this automatic thing and that enters our relationship with food in a way that's really unhealthy for us. And then having a hard time being present, right? If we're in a social situation, um, if we are at holiday events, at a party, and we're physically present, but mentally we are thinking about what our body looks like, if we're planning our workout for the next day in a way that doesn't bring us joy, right, then that's also time to maybe reflect on how obsessive our thoughts are and how much brain space is taking up for us. A big thing we talk about when we are addressing our body image overall is values, right? And we do values exploration. So it's okay for your wellness to be a value of yours. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But if we are starting to sacrifice things that we really care about to restrict food, to get a second or third workout in for that day, we might need to look at what's going on, right? If we are, maybe our faith is super important to us and we're not, we're replacing going to a religious service with a three mile run, right? So if we're unsure, if we're crossing into a dangerous area, we can ask someone in your support system, right? In our culture, especially as women, it feels like this very shame-based, intimate kind of scary thing to talk about our body image or insecurities. And being more vulnerable can actually be super helpful. So if you have someone you really trust, or maybe they have a, a good body image, or they you notice that they're um, sort of comfortable around food, they have a healthy relationship with food in their body, ask them like, hey, you know the things I care about. Do you think I'm sort of overdoing it on X, Y, and Z and get some support in that way? So I said we talk about values. This is an exercise that I do with clients in session or give them as homework. Um, so if we're kind of unsure about where we are and how we're allotting our time and spending our energy, we'll do this exercise. So in theory, it's not going, it's going to look perfect in theory, but not in practice, right? So I'll have folks come up with maybe four or five values that they think are top priority for them. Wellness, like I said, can absolutely be one of them. Maybe community is one of them. Maybe learning new things is another. And then novelty. Like, I really like going to new restaurants. I like not having a routine and changing things up. If we're sort of crossing a line into a place that might be disordered or obsessive, this wellness category might take up this whole pie chart, right? And that doesn't leave space for our other values. So we want to find balance in those things. So in order to do that, we don't have to look at it as taking things away, but we want to add in if novelty is important to us, we want to get outside of that routine and stray from this rigid schedule sometimes. Exercise as punishment is also something that's really big in 
sort of the fitness industry and something that I know Clarity is super passionate about too, is seeing movement as something that brings us joy, right? Something that we do not just for changing our body shape or size, but for our mental health, for our overall physical well-being. So we're starting to see exercise as making up for being bad or burning off as many calories as we can. If we're tracking that obsessively, it can create a relationship that with movement that becomes again, really obsessive and pretty negative. Um, if we're starting to like dread going to classes we used to enjoy, we just wanna take some time to reflect on what's changed for us. Maybe that form of movement isn't doing it for us anymore. And we wanna try weightlifting instead, or we wanna take a break and do yoga. Um, overall, when we're looking at improving our body image, we want to increase our mindfulness, which means actually listening to what our bodies need or want. It's cold and flu season, so a lot of folks are sick right now. If we're pushing through exhaustion to go work out, um, or if we aren't really listening to our bodies, again, it could be crossing into this line. So going for some gentler movement when our body's asking for it can be super helpful. And then our last sort of maybe warning sign is a really binary relationship with food. So if we're categor categorizing foods as good or bad, junk or clean, right? Whatever the terminology is, it creates this really black and white relationship with food and ultimately can increase our stress around mealtime. If we're looking at plating a meal and we're feeling all this pressure to say, okay, is this good for me? Is this bad for me? That's gonna increase my stress, right? And we want our relationship with food to be flexible. We want to enjoy food. We want to see food as fueling our bodies. And so getting away from this black and white thinking, again, being a little bit more mindful about it. We'll talk about intuitive eating towards the end of this conversation um, is what our ultimate goal is to improve our relationship with food and how it makes our bodies feel. All right, so I wanna introduce this idea. Um, health at every size or haze is what I'll refer to it probably moving forward is an idea that's really big in my community among eating disorder therapists, but see, it's not something that everybody's heard of, um, which we wanna change, right? Because it's very freeing. And again, going back to our values conversation, I think this aligns with people's values way more than um, feeling pressured to change our body shape and size or um, change our bodies for aesthetic reasons. So these are some of the principles. I would encourage you to do your own research, look up health at every size after this conversation, because I'm not going to do it justice and I can't go over all of it. Um, there's a lot of research around health at every size too, that once people start sort of adopting these principles and really living by it, they feel better, their health outcomes are better, their stress goes down even without weight loss. So they're engaging in more movement, their body image improves, their stress goes down without worrying about that number on the scale, which I think tells us everything that we need to know. So at the core of it, health at every size is about weight inclusivity. It's about eating for well-being, right? So getting out of that really strict diet culture and just eating for what makes us feel good. It's about respectful care as well. The, the biggest part of Haze that I won't do justice to tonight is the advocacy part of it. I'll touch on it a little bit, but it definitely includes finding providers that are aligned with your values too. We've known for a really long time that someone's weight and their BMI are really outdated ways to measure their physical health and overall well-being, and the medical community just hasn't really caught up to that yet. There are definitely providers out there that work from this framework and share these values, and so if you change one thing after this conversation, that's what I would encourage you to do is find providers that are more aligned with what you care about and the person you want to be versus sort of this outdated language. Um, it's about joyful movement, which I touched on just a minute ago, like finding a workout routine that makes you feel energized after and not really drained, right? So there's a ton of different ways to move your body, weightlifting, Pilates, yoga, dance, whatever that looks like. And if you are dreading workouts, if you're forcing yourself to do it, 
if you don't feel good about yourself while you're doing it, there's no point in doing it anymore, right? There are ways to improve your heart health, do whatever you want to do physically in a way that you don't feel like you're blocking out that time and just sort of dreading it the whole time. And then it includes an anti-diet approach, which I've touched on already. And like I said, we'll talk about intuitive eating towards the end of our conversation tonight. So overall, this is what HAYS kind of stands for. So I want to talk about how to incorporate HAYS into our everyday lives. So it's rejecting the idea that our weight, this number on the scale, or BMI is the biggest indicator of our well-being. As I don't want to speak for everyone, but as women, I feel like we're super tied. We're kind of raised to be super tied to this number on the scale, right? I think I got my BMI taken in gym class in high school, which is kind of weird for reflecting on it now. And also I had no idea what that meant. So I was like, cool, I have this number. I'm unsure what this means. No, no one talked about it ever again. It just kind of happened. Um, and we want to find opportunities to treat our bodies with respect and care, even if we don't like it that day. So if we respect something, it doesn't mean that we are um, approving of everything it does or everything it looks like, right? It just means that we don't cause it harm. So even at our, on our bad body image days, we want to avoid bringing our bodies harm, which includes restrictive eating, which includes using exercise as punishment. We want to treat our bodies well, even if we feel kind of uncomfy that day. And then like I touched on just a minute ago, we want to support ourselves with personal trainers. If you have an accountability partner for the gym, um, if you're following social media accounts, we want to make sure that they are aligned in these values, right? I will not go off on my social media soapbox because we'd be here all night, but there are a lot of accounts that are um, pretty immersed in diet culture. And to be honest with you, an eating disorder, and we just don't call it that, we call it wellness or dieting. Um, so we just wanna make sure that sort of what, what we're allowing access to us and our energy matches where we wanna go and what our goals are for our self-image and how we feel about our bodies. Okay, so once we embrace health at every size, I talked about some health outcomes just a second ago, but it can have this really beautiful impact on body image. Um, for anybody that hopped on after I mentioned this, I'm an eating disorder therapist, so I've walked alongside people as they really actively work on their body image and recover from bringing their bodies harm. So these are the some of the things that we work on. So body neutrality is, well, we'll talk about the difference between body positivity and body neutrality. Neither one of them is right or wrong. It's sort of what speaks to you more. So body neutrality is this idea that we can replace any negative or really harsh body talk with just factual neutral statements. The reason we want to go for neutrality sometimes is because if I'm living with this story about myself that my um, thighs are the worst part about me, right? I want to cover them up. I desperately want to change them. I'm so critical about them every time I look in a mirror. To ask me to change that statement, which is so far on the negative, to something positive that I love my thighs and they're so great and perfect, that is going to feel like such a big ask. And instead of trying to get from here to there, which is a big jump, I'm just going to be like, well, I could never believe that. So no, F that, right? So what feels a little more accessible is getting to a neutral place. So instead of asking us to go from, I hate my thighs to, I love my thighs, everything's perfect, we can just start with, I've got some thighs, right? They're here, they exist, I can feel them in my pants. Um, so in this image, it talks about body neutrality in identifying like what our body parts help us do, right? Like my legs carry me around. There's not a lot of room for emotion or criticism in that, right? I can't argue with that. My legs do carry me around, right? So that's the neutral part of it. The body positive part is if you feel like that's accessible, that's great. So expressing gratitude for your body, right? Or really learning to love and accept those body parts. This is just sort of another, I really couldn't choose between which graphic I liked more, so I just put both in here. But it talks about our goal mental state. And again, there's no right or wrong. It's just sort of what you connect with more. So in a body positive 
um, framework, our goal would be, I feel good about myself because I know that I'm beautiful, right? In a body neutral framework, it would be how I feel about myself really has nothing to do with my appearance. So it's de-emphasizing how important that is. And the end game for a body positive is we need to change the definition of beauty in our society, probably broaden it, right? And then body neutral is we just need to change the value of beauty in our society. So de-emphasizing again. Whatever speaks to you is what you should try to practice. Okay, so coping with bad body image days. The first two are highlighted in green because I'm gonna go over them in a bit more detail. Um, so I'll go, I'll start on this slide with the third one. We if we're having a bad body image day, and what I mean by that is potentially I wake up tomorrow, I look exactly the same as I do right now. And I feel horrible about myself, right? Or maybe I just started my cycle and I feel really bloated and my clothes don't fit me and everything's horrible, right? So that's a bad body image day. I think we've all had them. We know what I'm talking about here. So on those days, we want to avoid compensation, which is a fancy way to say trying to make up for it, right? Or changing it. So if I'm feeling super bloated, if I'm feeling like my pants don't fit me, I might have an urge to skip a meal or eat a smaller meal or just be really mad at myself if I decide to stop by McDonald's on my way to work, right? That's all compensating for it or doubling down on a diet. We want to avoid that. And I'll talk about why in just a second. We want to dress comfortably, right? There's absolutely no point in punishing ourselves with clothes that don't fit us or um, clothes that just fit in a way that we're not comfortable with that day, right? I can't tell you how many times either myself, right? I'm guilty of all of these things, by the way. I'm an eating disorder therapist, but also a human being who also lives in a diet culture world. So I do this stuff too, right? And my clients do this where we're like, I hate these pants so much. They're so tight on me. Then why do we walk out of the house with them on, right? Why don't we wear springs around the corner, a cute flowy dress? And then I don't have to think about how my stomach feels like that day. We want to avoid triggers. I've worked if we know what they are, right? Sometimes they're unpredictable and we're like, I had no idea that would make me feel that way. That's something we can cope with, right? Or get support around. If we're aware that we're feeling really bloated and uncomfy, don't go stand on the scale, right? Don't do that. It's not important. It's not gonna change what you do that day in a meaningful or helpful way. So we don't wanna try to trigger ourselves. Sometimes people get really trapped in this cycle of, kind of intentionally triggering themselves in order to find what we would call motivation, right? Like if I feel bad about myself, I'll look at my weight and then I'll work out extra hard. In theory, that kind of makes sense. We can understand that desire, right? But it brings us more harm than good in the long run. So we want to avoid those things. All right. So going over a cope ahead plan, um, and I have a copy of this that I'll drop in the chat at the end. Um, so a cope ahead plan is something that if you are in therapy or if you're thinking about going to therapy, it's something that would be super helpful to talk about with the therapist, or you can do it on your own or with someone that you trust. There's no like gatekeeping on this. So essentially what it is, is identifying common stressors or triggers for us and really getting down to the nitty gritty about how it might make us feel, what urges come up for us, and then making a plan about how we could cope with it effectively. This isn't, the intention behind this isn't to say, to prepare us for everything that could go wrong, because that's impossible, right? Or to make us feel really defeated that like things are going to go wrong and I have to figure out how to cope with everything. It's just to feel more prepared and competent if these are really common things you're facing. So the next time it rolls around, you're like, oh yeah, I wrote this down last week with my therapist or with my partner. So just one example, it's almost like a like a spreadsheet, and this would just be one row. So a trigger might be seeing that I've gained weight, right? I might feel disappointed. I might feel kind of frustrated, right? Or I might feel gross in my body. From those feelings, I might have an urge to get stricter on my diet. I might have an urge to work out really hard or to start tracking my calories again. If I have those urges, then the coping skills that I could use in that moment is talking to my friend about it, I could find movement that's more gentle, right? Instead of trying to punish myself with exercise or utilize those body neutral or body positive statements. All right, so that's our cope ahead plan. Opposite action is 
was also on the list of um, how to cope with bad body image days. So this is sort of the cycle. The intention or like the idea behind opposite action is that when we're acting on our urges a lot of the time, it kind of keeps us in this vicious cycle. So the example I use to explain it to clients a lot is like, if I feel depressed, right? If I just wake up feeling really sad, my urge is going to be to stay in my pajamas, close the blinds, listen to Phoebe Bridgers, cry in my bed, right? Like those are my urges because that's how I feel. If I do those things though, over and over and over and over again, I'm probably going to feel more depressed. So in this cycle, if we have a bad body image day, so starting with this green space over here, in the cycle, I might engage in a harmful behavior, right? And ultimately, I think I'm fixing how I'm feeling, but it's going to lead me to pay more attention to my body image or pay more attention to my flaws. And that is going to increase my bad body image day. So we stay in this really vicious cycle. So opposite action is going opposite to engaging in this harmful behavior. So we have the same thing happen. We have a bad body image day, right? So instead of engaging in the harmful behavior, we go opposite to that. So I might treat myself with extra kindness, right? I might avoid a mirror for a couple hours or avoid a body conscious activity if I have urges to like really, really hone in and focus on it. The idea isn't that it's going to totally fix our body image overall, but it's going to break us out of that cycle. Body image affirmations. I'll start with a caveat that some people really connect with affirmations and some people really don't, and that's okay. Take what you want and leave the rest. So these are just some examples. The thing with affirmations that I like to clarify with folks is that we don't have to 100% believe in these in the moment or be 100% on board for it to make a difference, right? So even if I'm telling myself, if I'm having a really hard time with my body image one day and I'm saying, my body is the least interesting thing about me. I obviously don't mean it in that moment, right? But it is going to change my thought process enough for it to make a difference for that moment, right? So I put on here neurons that wire together, fire together. If you've ever met a therapist, they've probably told you that before, meaning that I'm trying to change how I respond to bad body image days. I'm trying to have less self-criticism, right? So when I'm faced with a situation where I would criticize myself or be really mean to myself, if I start saying these affirmations, it's eventually going to pair it in my brain where I have a stressful situation and then I have the affirmation and that's going to be paired versus stressful situation criticism. So some examples of body image specific affirmations are, I deserve to nourish myself, right? We need nourishment. We want to see food as fuel. My body's the least interesting thing about me. So that's more of like a body neutral example, right? Even if we are feeling kind of crappy about our body that day, I um, have watched every episode of Law and Order. That's kind of scary and fun, right? I could talk about that at a party versus how my jeans are fitting me in that moment. And bodies are meant to change over time. I was telling Abby before we got on, I had a baby nine weeks ago. My body is very much different, right? In a lot of beautiful ways and a lot of really uncomfortable kind of scary ways. So they're meant to change over time. I think we get stuck in this goal, quote unquote, that we want to be the size we were in high school when we were a child, right? Like we don't have child bodies anymore. Our bodies are supposed to change over time. Our pre-baby body is supposed to be different than post-baby. Our um, body in menopause is supposed to look different than when we were a teenager, right? Like all of these things are things that are serving a different purpose for the person we are now. Okay, and goal setting can look different too if we're trying to see our bodies in a different way, right? So this is a little bit more tangible. If we are working on our fitness or diet goals, we can try to shift them a little bit to be less quantitative and a little more qualitative. Meaning instead of saying, I want to be a size six, I want to lose X amount of weight. We can say, I want to feel stronger. Like how do we want to feel about ourselves at the end of this month, at the end of this year? 
So qualitative meaning like, let's get away from the numbers and trying to quantify everything and really focus on what's important to us and how we see ourselves, how we show up in the world. We can also set goals for overall wellness, not just our physical or aesthetic related, right? There is this really big emphasis in our culture to get healthy and it leaves out a lot of the conversation, right? Somebody can have a great resting heart rate and be exactly where they want to be on that BMI chart um, and be really cruel to themselves or other people, right? And that's not healthy. So we want to sort of zoom out and take a big picture look at how we're feeling overall and maybe work on it, um, work on all of the aspects of ourselves. And goals should make sense for our lifestyle, for our body type, and for our values. Meaning, if you're working a job that requires you to work 60, 70 hours a week, it's not reasonable to ask yourself to spend three, four hours in the gym, right? If we're comparing ourselves to someone who's a fitness influencer and it's their literal job and their income is based on being in the gym, it's not fair to ourselves, right? So they should be reasonable for where we are right now. Our body type too is gonna to play, our genetics play a really big role in how we look and how we show up, how we respond to different types of exercise. So again, going back to that accountability piece, not accountability, advocacy piece with having people on our team that are aligned in these values, right? They can help have that conversation with you. Of like my mom did really well weightlifting, like maybe I should try that instead of doing cardio constantly, right? Like have people on your team that can have really healthy, open conversations with you and not try to force one type of movement or one sort of goal body image. And goals should also make sense for our values. So going back to that conversation, um, if it's really important to us that we are available and accessible to our family members and we are um, sleeping well so we can get up early and spend time with our kids or our dogs, if we're sacrificing those things for dieting or if we're noticing our lifestyle is um, hampering our ability to do that, then our goal should look different. All right, intuitive eating is something that I'm not a dietitian and I'm not a doctor, but we're going to talk about sort of the principles behind it, especially because I see intuitive eating all over social media. And I often hear a lot of fear around intuitive eating um, from people who are pretty used to like following rules around food, in their body, right? So we'll talk a little bit about it more about like what intuitive eating means and the values behind it. So intuitive eating is listening to our hunger and fullness cues, meaning when we're hungry, we eat, right? And when we're full, we stop. That is a huge oversimplification. Um, and at the same time, if we're dieting really hard, if we're stressing out our bodies in a lot of ways, those messages can get really mixed up. So it can take some work to get back to being able to listen to those things. Intuitive eating is also honoring our cravings and not being mad at ourselves if we have a craving, right? I talked about at the beginning of um, being in this diet cycle of what we restrict is what we binge, right? So if I say, okay, I'm really craving chocolate, I'm going to have this little Valentine's Day candy, I'm going to allow myself to have that and enjoy that. It's going to make me less likely to go back later and eat two boxes, right? And then feel probably pretty sick to my stomach and then maybe even mad at myself. So honoring cravings along the way gets a lot more easier, gets a lot easier. Um, it also means finding balance and making food choices that help us feel physically well. So what that can look like is I'm having a craving for something salty and crunchy. So I want to have potato chips, right? That makes sense. I know if I eat the whole bag of potato chips by itself, and then I have coffee because I have sessions later, I'm probably going to feel pretty bad in about an hour or so, and I'm going to feel hungry again, and that's going to set me up for failure. So I'm going to allow myself to have potato chips, but maybe I make like a Greek yogurt dip with it. So it makes me feel full. I know I'm getting protein. I know I'm getting fats. It's going to make me feel physically well too, but I'm not denying myself food that I want to eat and enjoy. 
It also looks like letting go of moral judgments of food. So going back to that conversation of this really binary way to categorize food, meaning good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, clean or junk. It's really hard to let go of that language. I've worked with a lot of um, teenagers in eating disorder recovery. And even when their parents are like super on board with changing their relationship with food too, it's just hard not to use those words because we all grew up with them, right? Um, I grew up hearing ads for like Weight Watchers, Atkins, Jenny Krebs, Slim Fast. It's all trendy, right? And it looks different now for our, our Gen Z babies who have different diet culture trends. Um, but it gets really, we get really immersed in it and we use this language too. So we just want to be mindful of it, right? Like, am I judging myself? Am I telling myself I'm bad because I had that chocolate cake? Um, once you hear it in yourself, you'll hear it in other people too, right? Um, and we can just extend compassion to ourselves and others like, oh, I'm doing that thing again where I'm letting my food choices dictate how, my, how I feel about myself or how my the rest of my day goes. So we want to let go of those moral judgments all food is morally equivalent, right? Like if we eat an apple or a brownie, it doesn't change who we are as a human being. Um, it doesn't make us better or worse. So we wanna let go of it. And then lastly, and maybe most importantly, it's permission to enjoy food and permission to eat foods that just make us feel good. Maybe their nutritional content looks a little bit different, um, but maybe it's culturally really important to us or maybe we're enjoying that food with a friend and good conversation and good company. And that's important too. So sort of getting out of this mindset of food has only this physical impact on me and I have to quantify it and I have to categorize it in this really particular way. That sounds really stressful. Like it would take a lot of time and energy versus saying food brings a lot of different aspects to my life. It fuels my body. Also, I get to sit with my partner and have breakfast or I get to cook with my kid, right? Like it does touch our lives in ways outside of ways we can just sort of track on my fitness pal. So that's what intuitive eating is. In this category or on this side of what intuitive eating isn't, these are all things that I hear from people that feel really fear-based, right? So if we're talking about intuitive eating in a session, I hear a lot of myths from people or I hear this fear of like, if I let go of all of my food rules or if I have no structure around my food and just eat intuitively, I'm gonna go off the deep end, right? I'm gonna start eating everything in sight. I'm gonna gain all this weight. I'm gonna feel horrible about myself. We really buy into this myth that we have to have really strict rules in order to have control and feel good about ourselves when in reality, all of those rules are harming our lives in ways that we probably are not cognizant of. So intuitive eating is not eating ice cream all the time, right? There's definitely time and space to enjoy ice cream. But if I ate ice cream for every single meal for seven days in a row, I'm going to feel physically unwell, right? And I'm probably going to get burned out on ice cream. And I don't want to do that to myself. I want to eat ice cream for the next however many decades. So it's not just eating what we would call junk food all the time, which I think is some people's understanding of it. It's also not binge eating. So again, it's listening to our hunger cues, but also our fullness cues, right? So if I say, okay, I'm going to not try to curb my appetite. I'm not going to take these supplements that are um, decreasing my appetite. I'm not going to use caffeine or whatever that looks like. I'm going to allow myself to eat when I feel hungry. If we're listening to our bodies in that way, we're also going to listen when we feel full. So we don't have to be fearful of overeating, right? It might feel, if we're used to really restrictive eating or really diet heavy eating, it might feel like a binge if we're just adequately nourishing ourselves. So if that is a gray area for you, it's something definitely to talk about with someone that you trust, maybe even a dietitian maybe a personal trainer who has a nutrition background, right? Your therapist, if that's someone you have access to, to help you understand like, is this binge eating? Is this going past all my fullness cues? Or am I just sort of getting used to what adequate nourishment looks like? 
Intuitive eating is also not an excuse to just eat unhealthy, right? It's definitely making space for foods that traditionally maybe we've denied ourselves, um, but it's all about that balance and moderation, right? And it's not a lack of discipline or a quote unquote gateway to weight gain, right? Again, these are all fears that I hear from people that are really valid, right? Like if you are looking at this column and you're like, oh, I'm really scared of that too. It's okay to feel that way. Um, a lot of the stuff I see about intuitive eating, I think misses sort of the core values around it. And the focus is like, now I allow myself to eat X, Y, and Z because I'm an intuitive eater, which is part of it for sure. But it can sort of create this really scary message to people who are really used to being really particular or really rigid in their diet and their eating. All right. Um, so before I go over some of these resources, if you have questions or comments or thoughts or feelings or anything along those lines about stuff that I talked about tonight, feel free to put it in the chat. It looks like we'll have a little bit of time to, to go over those things. If I can't answer your question, I'll try to point you in the direction of someone or something that can. Um, all right. So resources are where to go from here. These are a couple books that if reading is one of your goals for 2024 um, that you could look into and that I have read. I work with um, clients who we sort of work through these or I ask them to read it on their own. Um, so starting from the left, Mothers, Daughters, and Body Image um, is super interesting. It is written by um, a therapist who interviews moms and daughters and really sort of um, allows them to reflect on like how a mom's body image impacts her kids. So one sort of tidbit that I'll share with you all that I find really interesting is they interview like toddlers and ask them, what's the one part of your body you'd want to change? And even if it didn't make sense for a toddler body, their answer almost always matched what their mom's answer was. So a toddler doesn't really like have hips, right? Or like cellulite. But the kid would say that because their mom had said that. And even if their mom tried really hard to hide it or not talk about it in front of their kid, like they pick up on it. So if that's something that speaks to you at all, we know the biggest indicator of someone developing an eating disorder is dieting in the home growing up. If that speaks to you at all, this might be a good resource for you. Eating in the Light of the Moon is like the most therapist book title I could possibly think of. Like it sounds so woo-woo, I'm so sorry, but it's really good. It's about sort of like tuning into yourself and all of the things we talked about tonight. Like what is my relationship with food and how can I sort of get away from this really shame-based space? That's what this book is at its core. And then the Intuitive Eating Workbook, there's a book and then there's a workbook. Um, and I know a lot of dietitians that will like, assign worksheets to their clients from this. It's also something you could kind of work through yourself if you're trying to just look at your relationship with food and get away from like this diet cycle. Um, all right, so here are just a couple on the left over here, a couple Instagram accounts that I really like. They are body positive or body neutral um, and also just really like fun fashion. Um, and talk about like how to change how you dress based on like how you're feeling on your body that day. So if you're looking to replace some unhelpful people on your feed, those might be ones to look at. This is my contact information. Um, if you connected with any of the stuff we talked about tonight, this is what I talk about in session. So if you are nervous about starting therapy or if that's something kind of on your list of things to do in 2024, reach out to a therapist, um, reach out to me if you feel like it'd be weird because I was in a webinar with you, I can point you in the direction of other therapists. Um, there's a lot of support, especially in the Atlanta area and virtual too, around body image, around being a woman in diet culture, being a woman in a larger body, whatever that looks like. If you wanna reach out um, and learn more about those resources, then that's my contact information.